learning to love the sound of your own voice is almost a taboo subject, really. And I did that early, mercifully for myself. I must have known that the walls were closing in on all other aspects of my <laughs> of my psyche. And I said, what can I what do I have here? You know, what what can I learn? You know, what can I love in myself? And I knew I could just about sing and I knew I could drum. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop the rot here. I'm just going to love it. That's it. I'm just going to love it. And uh, and I learned to love the sound of my own voice. And I learned to make music when I was alone. And that just speaks for itself. And the, the poem is called Early Music. And it just brings us to a place which we can all recognize in ourselves. Hello and welcome to Waking Up with Brooke Sproul. My guest today is the wonderful Michal O'Sullivan. Michal, welcome. Hello, everybody. Hello from County Clare in Ireland. Yes, I met Michal uh, traveling with David White in Italy this summer, and we had a beautiful time playing music and writing poetry and walking for miles along the Italian landscape. And uh, Michal is just a beautiful soul, an incredible poet, an incredible uh, vocalist as well. And so uh, I wanted to to connect and see... Um, See what see what emerges in our conversation today, uh, Michal. Talk to me about uh, your work as a, a poet and a vocalist, and how that connects with your spiritual practice and spirituality. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, well, where where we met, one of the unexpected turns that my vocation as a musician. I started as a drummer, which is a an archetypal thing, I suppose, and uh, then ran to the front of the stage and became a singer. Uh, all sorts of singing and um, cheap tricks I was uh, guilty of doing on stage and um, became quite virtuosic and quite funny, actually. And um, humor has been a, 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 a definite element of my journey, uh, both the, the, the honing of the craft of comedy and humor and then also trying to uh, smooth out its virtuosity in my life as well. And one of the unexpected turns uh, where we met as, as a guide, which is very much the physically taking people places, you know. Of course, uh, being a singer, I was very struck early on coming from a drumming background and noticing people dropping down into another space when a rhythm would be put forward. But when one sings a cappella, as it is in it, it, Italian, but um, when it's unaccompanied, when one sings the solo voice, people drop into a reverie uh, almost immediately. It's a very powerful thing. And it, for me, for a long time, um, keeping my eyes closed was the only option when I would sing. Uh, or, I would, or I would get quite emotional, actually. If I met eyes with people, I would get very, very emotional very quickly. And the same thing happened when I first started reading poetry as well I would have to keep my eyes closed but there comes a time of course when one has to open their eyes and show their virtuosity you know overhear themselves and my spiritual practice around around performance of music and poetry is still happening to be honest I feel like I was asleep a lot of my life like many of us and woke up I'm now 38 years old that has been a great thing when I opened my eyes again and overheard myself of course in psychotherapy you're supposed to overhear yourself but yesterday I was working with a person online in these poetry conversations that I have and they were working with a performance coach this is just yesterday and the performance coach asked that person do you hear yourself when you speak and that really struck me you know because Performance is the art of hearing yourself speak, of course, and speaking and and all life. But also there's a an element where you're supposed to let things flow and enter into a flow state. And that then is letting go of, of listening to yourself. So you're not supposed to do more of either. Um, so you, you yourself enter into a kind of a reverie, I suppose. And music and poetry has always brought me into a ritual space, music especially. And then David... White, my collaboration with him, I see it as a ritual space as well, really, in a literary sense. But uh, so I was always uncomfortable being in, in, a, in a spiritual place, but always had the currency of it. 
So it left me feeling like a fraud, actually, for many, many years. And that I was unworthy that I was that I was a singer. I, I hadn't, of course, like most of our blockages, I hadn't <laughs> articulated this to myself yet. But um, I just felt all the more like I was singing beautifully, but I wasn't walking the walk. You know, I was um, I was like a hedonist, like most people in their 20s. I was just a hedonist and um, quite negative and cheap laughs and. I wasn't dropping down to that, to the level I was singing at, you know. So that's a long answer to 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 the spirituality, my relationship to the spirituality of my creation. That's where you're supposed to be uncomfortable, you know. What you shared about um, closing your eyes, I relate to that as a singer. Um, you know, there's something around this vulnerable expression and uh, outward expression where you're simultaneously wanting to be seen and then not wanting to be seen in your vulnerability, in your expression. And so that is part of the struggle of an artist who's who's kind of birthing their own voice and their own expression. Uh, so I very much relate to that uh, as well as, you know, the the heaviness and the depth of what we bring forth as artists. Uh, there's a tremendous weight to it. And uh, it becomes very, um, yeah, that, that vulnerability is, is, is heavy. The flip side, of course, is, is artists who kind of love themselves a little bit too much, which is, which is a uh, marginally more repulsive than, than one who's too apologetic. In fact, I have a poem. I, I have one collection of poetry and there is a poem about just this thing, actually, and it's called the virtuoso. And, um, I have always just loved the idea of when I was a kid, there was a very famous violinist called Paganini, an Italian virtuoso on the on the violin. And they they said that he sold his soul to the devil to have to to have this skill at viol, viol, violin. And he would play for thousands of people. And as a kid, I was always like, what? He sold his soul to the devil for a beautiful art form, you know, and they often say that about virtuosos or or the, or about those those brilliant that they must have done a deal, um, a short term deal, you know, with um, a long term price to pay, and uh, that really set me off. And I remember I must have been very very young when I heard that uh, the tale of classical music, of course. But uh, another thing that I suffered from as well a lot of my life is a belief in like the excellence of my craft or 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 the spiritual nature of it. But just these um. Uh, unconscious apologies would come from my mouth before or or uh, when you cheapen an experience which my mother never did and uh, my father used to often read poetry before he'd play piano um, as a kind of a setting as a way of bringing it um, and it's a good way of stopping yourself making a joke or something and um, the poem is called The Virtuoso I'll dedicate it to all of us waking up here and it goes I don't care if you're sorry. I don't care if you're sorry, nor do you even anymore. Why atone for your gifts? Express remorse for your ability, begging pardon in public. Be instead the unrepentant virtuoso for you choose to stand, showing us the spirit stir, then fill and overflow within you. The spirit does not ask forgiveness nor permission. And upon your stage, you can do no wrong. Get out of the way. We love what you have and need no reminder of our sentence here on earth. Please just set us free. Mm. I love that. Get out of the way. Getting out of the way really struck me because what I think is true, authentic art uh, and writing is, is really becoming a sort of channel for spirit. And quite often we can't even explain where we're getting our ideas, um, where the source is. When I was in Italy with you all, it was like poems were just channeling through me. I didn't even know where they were coming from. And typically it'll take me years to write a poem and rewrite and edit it. And it was like, I was writing these, you know, first drafts that were, you know, only needed a few minor tweaks. Mm -hmm. It was like, they were just gifted to me from yes. above. It didn't feel like I was writing them. And, and that, you know, for me is, is a really powerful spiritual expression is when the art just flows through us. And it's really just a matter of getting our own ego out of the way. 
the 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 element of permission around creativity is 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 very close to my heart you know that and i found that working with my collection of poetry there's a, a section in it under mythology and coming from ireland where we have such a rich mythology it's not as well uh recorded as greek or roman uh stories so in Irish mythology, you kind of have gods like enter stage left of random stories. They kind of come in and out and nobody knows why or what the relationships are. And, they, and then later, of course, you have St. Patrick coming in and saving our gods and the gods coming in and saving St. Patrick and all of this type of thing. A big uh, overlap. But uh, I found that working with mythology as a poet, you know, there's part of our um, part of our uh art form is to work with shared archetypal energies and um then mythology you know one one has to have a strand of that in one's own poetry if one is to you know pursue the craft at least privately and it's just great material you know you don't need to do much uh you don't need to do much uh research into a certain god or a certain story to to, to write a good old poem and to see your own reflection in it so it's very popular as material. But in in Ireland, I was suffering from a, a serious lack of, of a permissive uh, essence, you know. Um, in Ireland, like we, we, we work with mythology in kindergarten and early um, primary school or, 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 or first level school when we're kids. And then there's a there's a large gap. And then, of course, you're supposed to do it in third level. So or even a PhD level, you know, you have to choose it. And um, so it's kind of like infantilized the mythology or else it's institutionalized and there's no ownership between it. And and I don't know why that is. I mean, in Ireland, we, we have this thing called post-colonialism where you're like getting over the trauma of being taken over or colonized. You could blame it on that, that we're, we infantilized the, the beautiful archetypes in our own culture, but I don't know why it is either. Maybe the Catholic Church, you know, they were so influential in our education system for so long that, you know, it was it's seen as um, risque, like a lot of it. Once you dig beneath the surface of any mythological canon, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of hot and steamy stuff going on. And um, so it, I I was coming to poetry as an adult looking for that permission to work with myth, with mythology and uh, and found it very challenging and. Uh, so yes, I, I I know what you mean. And after a while, the dam, the soul dam burst uh, and I got a few poems out of it. Mm. But it took me a lot of work. Yeah, it took me a lot of work. So, mm. but that permission you felt in Italy, yes. And this podcast came out of that. Um, you were feeling more than, than just the poetic muse. Uh, there was a whole new chapter mm. opening up for you around then. Yeah. What you said earlier about this tension between hearing yourself and not hearing yourself in these artistic spaces, I think is so profound because there is a simultaneous need for to bear witness to one's own gifts and voice while also not then identifying and it becoming an ego expression. And so there's, I noticed for me, Sometimes I'll be singing, even in the privacy of my own home, and my voice will do something it hasn't done before. It'll open up in such a way. And then I immediately am like, oh, it's doing this thing. And I and I'm, I get so excited. And then it goes away. It's like this feeling of, like you said it so beautifully, this kind of flowing, uh, this ability to, to hold the structure of it while also flowing. And I think yeah. that's a really powerful way to talk about this art form. I love what you said about your own voice and listening and, and overhearing it. And there's a poem, the flagship poem, the title poem of my collection is about that. One of the premises of those songs of life sessions is that we create a repertoire of songs that we sing when we're on our own so that we can own these songs. They're not party pieces. They're not necessarily to be performed for anybody. And that's been a great friend to me over the years is to create these little gems that I've committed to memory that you can work work on yourself. Learning to love the sound of your own voice is almost a taboo subject, really. And I did that early, mercifully for myself. I must have known that the walls were closing in on all other aspects of my <laughs> of my psyche. And I said, what can I 
what do I have here? You know, what what can I learn? You know, what can I love in myself? And I knew I could just about sing and I knew I could drum. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop the rot here. I'm just going to love it. That's it. I'm just going to love it. And uh, and I learned to love the sound of my own voice. And I learned to make music when I was alone. And that just speaks for itself. And the, the poem is called Early Music. And it just brings us to a place which we can all recognize in ourselves. Mm. For I learned to make music when I was alone. Revering the moment before I began to sing, then break the solitary silence. I learned to love my own voice, making a fountain pen to master the phantom language. Each Brandenburg concerto turned up loud, furrowing ground, while my father drilled his impossibly strong fingers on the steering wheel, careening the back roads of Bird Hill. My mother would sing alone for hours. Hildegard and Shannos seamlessly sung. Light would stream in the sash window while she scribbled illegibly, preparing for a performance. I would drum my hands on my thighs until they were hot and red, repeating the same beat thousands of times, honing the same phrase. And in the evening we would gather around two candles and early music on cassette. An instrumental combination to unlock conversation and make the silences dance like candlelight. No vocal music to deflect or distract from a small family huddled around only food and flame and the warm faint sound of gut string. A family that feels safe is sacred. Echo soundings still bounce back, reflected in the sound of early music. What comes up for me is this feeling that as artists, we're constantly transmuting the ordinary into, um, we're constantly kind of fanning the ordinary daily into this flame of the miraculous and the magical. And there's an attention that needs to be paid to the present moment and the mundane um, in order to find the portal into the otherness of the world. And I find myself as someone who's equally artistically inclined as I am sort of entrepreneurial, <laughs> mm. I'm constantly um, kind of... Uh, Pulled between the part of me that wants to move really fast and achieve and get things done and the part of me that wants to slow down and connect with this spiritual and artistic sentiment and it's easier for me to uh, be in the part of me that is busy and productive and achieving it's more comfortable and it's not vulnerable and there's a motivation and there's even an addiction in it sometimes um, but I'm finding that while I don't want to give that part of me up, um, I'm wanting to put it in equal balance with the spiritual and artistic part, because really at the end of the day, what makes life worth living is not what we achieve. It's how we relate to each day and each moment. And so I've been really trying to find a balance between, um, in a way, the present and future, you know, the ability to hold future dreams and goals as inspiration um, without overriding my, uh, my presence and my mm. ability to connect with the beauty of what is ordinary in a day. Well, one of my favorite quotes from one of David's poems is, alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity because that is exactly what it is. And, and Henry, who we've talked about, Henry Shookman, um, mm. in one of his meditations, he talks about this illusion that, um, the illusion that we've lived any moment before, and this idea that actually each moment is so wholly new. Uh, in one of my poems, I, I say something like, this moment is totally new and wholly yours or something like mm -hmm. that. There's this idea of the born newness of now and mm -hmm. um, we forget. And that's why awakening is often posited as a remembrance 
because there is actually a diligent attention and discipline in remembering our spiritual nature and recovering the magic of the world that I think is central to the artist's kind of task in life. We have to see ourselves as, yeah, the virtual so that we can make, there has to be, and you touched on it earlier, and it's a, I suppose it's one of the characteristics, the cardinal characteristics of mania, isn't it? Like that we have to have both um, a huge ego and a and an overly huge humility at the same time and insecurity and this um this this narcissism playing off them to each other. I mean, why else would I be here trying to learn anything to perform for anyone if not for self gratification on some level? But it's mostly, thankfully, um, because I've seen it work. Um, it's hard to believe how powerful one speaking voice is, uh, even even a, an imperfect one, um, if one has any level of of virtuosity or confidence and that virtuosity for me is not an excellence not a paganini like scales up and down it's just simply an not not apologizing you know um so it is it's a very much a discipline but it's a it's also unfortunately it's like a family business if you don't see it if you don't see it being done you know it's very difficult to master it's a craft you know I, I so relate to the apologizing for your art um when I was really involved in the poetry scene and reading around town the feedback that I would continually get is that I read my poems so quickly and as I look back it was like I was I almost was hoping no one would hear what I was saying <laughs> It was like I was hoping that no one that I wouldn't really be exposed in my vulnerability by uh, moving so quickly and and stay, saying the poem so rapidly. Um, there was a there was a mask there, you know, this mm -hmm. un unconscious defense mechanism of, OK, here I am on stage wanting to be heard in one way and also in another way, just you know, don't look here. You know, it's really interesting, yeah. this this tension that we have mm -hmm. as artists. Yes. And, you know, one can one can send out loving kindness and one can also just send out a bit of narcissistic kindness as well, because if the more you believe you're on the right path and believe in in the poems, ironically, it's like it's like a con. It kind of it, it's it's a con, actually, which comes from the word confidence. I, I didn't know that to recently. <laughs> But you you give people confidence in you and you do that by by fooling them. And therefore, you're doing it by fooling yourself. So it's a, it's it, it does have that element, but it's a, it's a, it's a light. It's light work. You know, um, you have to kindle it in, in yourself and your intentions are hopefully, hopefully pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty positive. You know, um, so in that sense, so that belief in the path you're on and. If you are a performer I, or I'm myst mystified by by your own profession as well of, of psychotherapy, that's what you like to call it, and um, and the art of listening and holding secrets um, for 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 your life. That belief in your own vocation is essential for, I think, psychotherapy or more performative vocations as well. And what comes to mind is a poem I recently committed to memory, but I found I saw people perform with my mother throughout my childhood. And it's a translation of a Mirabai poem. And Mirabai was an Indian princess. And she, uh, there's lots of stories written about her because she left the confines of the royal palace and she went off in a group of spiritual abandons and hit the road and traveled around <clears throat> living the life of a um a, a traveling spiritual, you know, footloose person, bringing great shame upon her family because she was married to a prince who died. And as the tradition was at the time, a woman was supposed to throw herself on the funeral pyre of that man. But Mirabai refused and left the palace half, half banished. But she was making a show of the family anyway, out on the, the hollow lands and hilly lands of India. And her brothers were sent out to bring her back. And this is a translation of, of that, one of the many um, vignettes of Mirabai uh, in the Indian tradition, in translation by Robert Bly. 
called Why Mira Can't Go Back to Her Old Home. The colors of the dark one have penetrated Mira's body, all other colors washed out. Making love with the dark one and eating little, these are my pearls and my carnelians. Chanting beads in the forehead streak, these are my scarves and my rings. That's enough feminine wiles for me. My teacher taught me this, approve me or disapprove me. I follow the mountain energy day and night. I take the path that ecstatic human beings have taken for centuries. I do not hit anyone. I hurt no one. What will you charge me with? I have felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders, and now you want me to climb on a jackass. Try to be serious. Yeah, there's a transportation that happens with this work where there's something so visual. It's almost like a um, past life regression or something. You're stepping into this experience as this other being with its own imagery and, and memories. It's really powerful. I think I've always, uh, as, a, as a result of insecurity, physical insecurity, I suppose, um, always felt the reaction of people to be uh, incongruous with what I was putting out, you know, like people often, in a lot of ways, my life um, feels like uh, I'm more inclined to believe that no one else exists. And like, this is just my imagination, because sometimes people like, if when I was a kid as well, I'd say something and like a whole room would laugh. And like, I wouldn't know why, you know, like, I think that happened to me marginally more than kids, you know, it happens, happens to every kid. But, and I, I do find that people, there's something else does, does come through and uh, that people's reactions to songs and poems. And uh, I would be inclined to believe that there's something uh, multidimensional going on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that is though. That's how poetry feels for me too, when I'm writing. And it reminds me of a poem by, T.S. Eliot, I can't remember what it's called. It's something about Magi, the journey of the Magi, I believe. And when I read that poem first, it was like, I've been there. I, I've seen that. There was something, it, it wasn't the specifics, but it was the um, experiential quality of the poem, of the journey uh, that felt very familiar in its eccentricities and strangeness. Um, mm. And there was something about that, um, that kind of writing that does feel like a, a genuine transportation. I also think about that with Rumi's work, you know, just there's something about it that um, takes me somewhere else um, that still feels familiar, but doesn't feel like it's of me. There is a very physical sense of the esoteric um, power of, of singing if, if, if one believes in one's virtuosity or the, the craft, I suppose seeing David White as well, like the first time I saw him speak, I didn't know that a person could do that. You know, I had seen po poetry recited, but I had never gone into the reverie around somebody speaking in such an interdisciplinary level. I often say that I grew up with two academic parents and outside of the scaffolding of an institution of academia or musicology or a uh, or a concert, you know, the scaffolding of a musical performance. I had never, I had been to poetry readings, but never, never ones without notes, never ones without a podium, never ones with, and David uh, is an interesting and virtuosic performer of the ages. And when he stands on stage, he doesn't move his feet. He won't move his feet for the whole session. So maybe when he tells a joke, sometimes he'll shuffle because the energy breaks. <clears throat> but then once he finds his feet again, he'll just speak until till the next gag probably <laughs> so I learned a lot uh, from that and um, the virtuoso as well speaks about his influence over me has been monumental of course and um, the virtuoso speaks for it is you who chooses to uh, show the spirit stir then fill and overflow within you and in a sense that line is dedicated to him but also that moment when we're on stage in silence when we're holding a silence, and of course, in your vocation too, holding silence can be just so healing. And um, how do you read how long the silence has gone on? And David, uh, my brother asked that to David once in, in private, and he said, well, actually, when I do find a silence come to me, and sometimes it can come to me in the middle of a poem, he'll just leave it, um, that he will imagine a vessel of water filling up um, 
you know, with a, with a drips or, or a small stream of water. And when that vessel begins to overflow, when he can feel it uh, breach, then he'll begin speaking again. And I've, I've seen him hold silences for, around, I'd say, I'd say maybe between two and three minutes, which is a long, long time. You know, the, the belief in the virtuosity of, of art conquering all, you know, um, and the, the idea of excellence is, is um, not even excellence, just 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 faith in the process. You know, we all go through chapters of our life where we get exhausted of ourselves. And we take down the we kick down the walls of our of our identity, you know. And um, art can both suspend our disbelief and, you know, speed up our mental breakdowns as well. As, depending on how we walk in, I often say me hanging around with David White or all of the, the um, I suppose all of the on the other end of the spectrum, all of the, the Hollywood kind of celebs as well. It just sped up my kind of breakdown. I figure I have like a duty to my peers because i figure that i had i'm i'm i did what they're going to be in five years you know so my david did me a favor the poetry did me the favor of inducing my uh my my wake up you know there's an acceleration of the process of uh dying and and entering into this new paradigm so seeing how people reinvent themselves through poetry and come to the well in transition parts of their life um, made me realize how how incendiary um, to the self the, the work is, you know, and uh, David White is is very strong, I feel, in almost every facet of his psyche, you know, and that's why he's been able to keep going. And um, and I hope to get that strong one day, you know, to to be a touring like that bulletproof touring artist, when I look at those professional drummers, you know, I often see, do you know when you go to see Sting or like you go to see like U2 or something like that and you see the drummer at the back, you know, and you're like, they're often like, I don't know, 300 pound, like, you know, Afro wearing, whatever. And um, that guy or that girl, um, Michael Jackson had a really good girl drummer for a long time. They have like drum, drum kits, like onto the next venue, like in a van right now, you know, like they've, they've got three kits on the road and they might be doing two gigs, you know, in one day and things like this. They're just like really, really disciplined. And David has a bit of that. And I just hope to get really disciplined and pass on these poems that I've curated over my life. And that brings me into a, a mode of prayer or that ritual space, you know, because I, I, have, I have trouble um accessing a meditative prayer space outside of music or, or poetry you know i've got serious i've got serious issues but uh Don't so I, I find myself writing about, but i think everyone can find their mode of prayer outside of actively praying for some it's philanthropy for mm -hmm. some it's for some it's that's so that's so beautiful there's so many ways to pray and that's something i'm remembering right now and cultivating in my life singing is a prayer poetry is a prayer um you know walking on the beach is a prayer looking at the world in a new way as a type of prayer um so what a beautiful note to end on michal thank you so much for being here today thanks so much thanks for listening everybody it's a real pleasure wonderful to see you take care <laughs>